you all for being here, and thank you to Law for that beautiful talk. Um, um, I'm Maya Shumeli. Um I'm a third year student here at Evergreen, and um, currently I'm studying dance and psychology. Um, I hope to become a dance movement therapist in the future, and currently um, my focus is on ecstatic dance, uh, movement meditation, holistic health, mind-body medicine, and consciousness studies. Um, I've always seen a connection between the spiritual experience and mental health, and I strongly believe that everybody should have the right to explore altered states, um, whether it be through dance, music, um, artistic exploration, or the psychedelic experience. Um, a subject that I've been passionate about for the past uh, six or so years of my life is, is cannabis and its potential for mental and physical healing. Um, throughout my life, I've been exposed to a lot of stigma about cannabis and the people who use it. Um, however, uh, for many of my peers who use cannabis intentionally and consciously, uh, the benefits of this sacred plant seem to outweigh the supposed dangers. For this reason, I decided to research the ways that cannabis has been used as a medicine throughout history to help educate the public about this natural healer. Um, this talk will focus mainly on the different ways cannabis has been used medicinally in the past and how it currently benefits medical patients and the potential for cannabis to cure diseases in the future. Um, yeah, this has been a really fun learning experience for me, putting this speech together, and I hope that you learn something new. Um, so I'm going to begin with a, a timeline of, of cannabis use as medicine. Uh, starting with cannabis in the ancient world, beginning with China. Um, so one of the earliest human civilizations sprouted up against, along the Huanghuo River in China. The banks of the Huanghuo were perfectly suited for agriculture because of the richness of the soil and annual deposits of new silt. One of the plants that grew plentifully in this part of the world was hemp, which was harvested for its strong fibers that were woven together as fabric ending man's dependence on animal skins for clothing. Hemp gradually became an important aspect in many parts of ancient Chinese life. Hemp clothed the Chinese from head to toe, provided them with material to write on, and eventually became a representation of power over evil. Since early Chinese doctors believed that illness and imbalances were caused by demons invading the body, Ancient priest doctors used charms, amulets, spells, and sacrifices in order to drive evil entities away from a sick person. Included in their collection of mystical healing tools was a cannabis stalk, carved into the shape of a snake. Healers used these stalks to exorcise demons by striking them against the bed of a sick person and commanding it to leave their body. Knowledge of cannabis as a healer in ancient China eventually grew from superstition and folklore to being recognized as a medicinal tool. Although magic and mysticism were still considered important parts of healing, plant medicines were gradually accepted as methods of curing disease. The father of ancient Chinese medicine, the legendary emperor Shen Nung, who lived during the 28th century BC, used himself as a test subject for herbal remedies by ingesting up to 70 different poisons in a single day and figuring out natural antidotes for each of them. When he completed these tests, he had discovered hundreds of healing compounds derived from vegetable, animal, and mineral sources, which he compiled in his book, The Pen Sao. The first edition of the Pen Sao dates back to the first century AD and contains the first written mention of ma, the Chinese word for cannabis. According to, the, to ancient Chinese, ma contained both properties of yin and yang. Yin symbolizes the passive, gentle, feminine aspect of nature, while yang encompasses the strong, bold, masculine qualities. Diseases were considered to be caused by an imbalance of yin and yang in the body. This made cannabis a difficult drug to prescribe because it encompassed both masculine and feminine essences. To solve this issue, Shen Nung proposed that the female plant would be the only plant cultivated as the only form of the plant cultivated as medicine in China because it contained more medicinal properties than the male plant. It was used to ease symptoms of conditions associated with an overabundance of yang energy in the body 
including menstrual fatigue, gout, absent-mindedness, constipation, and malaria. In a pharmacopoeia written during the Tang Dynasty, it was recorded that the root of the cannabis plant could be prescribed to remove a blood clot, while a juice made from the plant's leaves could cure tapeworms. Powdered cannabis seeds mixed with rice wine was recommended as a medicine for various ailments, including constipation and hair loss. It is written in the Chinese Materia Medica, Vegetable Kingdom, a manual describing plant cures historically used in Chinese medicine, that every part of the hemp plant can be used for healing pain or illness. The flowers are recommended for menstrual disorders and wounds. The seeds are prescribed for curing fluxes, postpartum difficulties, vermilion and aconite poisoning, constipation, and vomiting. The oil has been used for hair loss, sulfur poisoning, and dryness of the throat. The juice pressed from the leaves has been used as an anthelmintic, a drug that expels internal parasites from the body without harming the host. In the second century, cannabis was discovered to aid patients in relieving pain during surgery. This knowledge is credited to the famous Chinese surgeon Hua To, who is known for per performing who was known for performing complex incisions while causing minimal pain. It is said that his surgical procedures were made painless by giving his patients an anesthetic called Ma Yo, a mixture of cannabis resin and wine. India. Cannabis also has a long and complex history in India. The first mention of cannabis in India was found in the Vedas, the Atharva Veda specifically, or sacred Hindu texts. It is unknown when these writings were compiled, um, but historians believe it was as early as 2000 to 1400 BC. According to the Vedas, cannabis was one of five sacred plants and was described as a liberator and source of happiness that was gifted to humans for the purpose of relieving anxiety. The Hindu god Shiva is often associated with the cannabis plant. An ancient legend tells of Shiva wandering off into a field after an argument with his family and drifting off to sleep under a leafy plant in the hot sun. When he awoke, his curiosity led him to try the leaves of the plant and he instantly felt rejuvenated. This legend is, sent, is said to be the origin of bong, a drink made, made of the leaves and buds of the female cannabis plant that has been popular in India for thousands of years and is an integral part of North Indian culture. Sadhus and Sufis use bong to aid in meditation and to achieve spiritual ecstasy. In parts of rural India, bong is believed to cure fever, dysentery, sunstroke, to clear phlegm from the lungs, aid in digestion and appetite, to cure speech imperfections and lisping, and to rejuvenate and give alertness to the body. The plant was also frequently used to relieve pain during childbirth. Cannabis is now technically illegal in India, but it is permitted in certain states such as West Bengal, Bihar, Orissa, Tripura, and the Northeast due to Hindu customs. Bong is sold in government-owned shops in holy cities like Varanasi. Cannabis, locally called ganja, is used prevalently in India. The laws against cannabis use and possession are largely unenforced and treated with very low priority. Cannabis grows wild and unregulated in many parts of northern and southern India. Although the Chinese and Indian cultures knew about the properties of the drug from very early times, this information did not become general in the Near and Middle East until after the 5th century AD, when travelers, traders, and adventurers began to carry knowledge of the drug westward to Persia and Arabia. Egypt. The Ebers Papyrus is an Egyptian medical document containing herbal healing information dating back to 1550 BC and is one of the oldest and most widely known medical documents of ancient Egypt. The Ebers Papyrus, along with the Ramsium III Papyrus, the Berlin Papyrus, and the Chester Betty Medical Papyrus reported a medical usage of the cannabis plant, which was used by Egyptians as a suppository to ease the pain of hemorrhoids and ingested to treat sore eyes. <clears throat> it is unknown when medical use of cannabis began in ancient Egypt or in ancient Greece. However, ancient Greeks had been eating cannabis seeds before they were used medicinally. The physiological effects produced by eating the seeds may have inspired ancient Greeks to use the plant for healing, healing purposes. 
It is likely that the earliest account of medical cannabis being used in ancient Greece is contained in the Materia Medica, published by Greek physician Dioscorides around 65 CE. It is also referenced by Pliny the Elder in his book Historia Naturalis, in which it is recorded to have been used to treat earworms, headaches, soften contracted joints, relieve gout attacks, and heal burns when applied to the skin. Greek historian Herodotus described in the 5th century BCE how the Scythians, a group of I Iranian nomads, used cannabis in hot steam baths because they believed that inhaling the vapor produced was medicinal. Cannabis was not only used for human medicine, but in veter veterinary medicine to heal wounds and sores on their horses. Dried cannabis leaves were used to treat nosebleeds, and the seeds were eaten to kill tapeworms. Steeping green cannabis seeds in either water or wine was the most frequently described use in ancient Greece. The soggy seeds were later used to treat ear pain and inflammation. The book of Exodus has multiple references to a holy anointing oil that was used to set sacred objects apart from secular ones. This oil contained cinnamon, myrrh, cassia, olive oil, and six pounds of a plant called cannabosum, which is speculated by some researchers to have been cannabis. In the book of Exodus, Moses was instructed by God to anoint the sacred meeting tent and all objects inside with the holy oil. It was also used in the installation rites of Hebrew kings and priests. The anointing oil containing cannabosum is also referenced in the New Testament. According to a study of scriptural, te scriptural texts published in 2003, Jesus and his followers would cover themselves in the sacred oil to bring themselves closer to God. Um, cannabis historian Chris Bennett strongly believes that cannabosum was the cannabis plant because it was believed to have healing powers, but other researchers hypothesized that the plant may have been cane balsam or the Indian plant Rosha grass. Medicinal use of the cannabis plant continued into the Middle Ages. European crusaders returning from the Holy Land brought back knowledge of healing with cannabis, which was popular as an ointment and a salve for dressing wounds. Cannabis was frequently mentioned, frequently mentioned in English medicinal recipes of the 14th and 15th centuries. Reference to the use of the plant for healing venereal disease and coughs appeared in the records of St. John the Baptist Hospital in Winchester. Medieval Muslims used the plant to treat gastrointestinal issues, dandruff, aid in digestion, increase appetite, and soothe ear pain. In 1538, English botanist William Turner wrote in his book, A New Herbal, that marijuana had many curative properties and that it is especially helpful for healing burns. The first proven record of cannabis in the New World was in 1545 AD when it was brought to Chile by the Spaniards. It was brought to Virginia by Jamestown settlers in 1611, where it was cultivated and highly valued for its durable fiber. It was introduced to New England in 1629 and from then on was a major American crop until after the Civil War. Ironically, America's first marijuana law was passed in 1619, making it mandatory for every farmer in Virginia to grow cannabis plants because they were so useful and profitable. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin all grew and advocated the cultivation of the hemp plant. Cannabis has a rich history in the Western world, but was not revered for its medical properties in the US until the mid 19th century. The United States Pharmacopoeia enlisted cannabis as a pharmaceutical from 1850 to 1942, and many companies sold cannabis extract, which was considered to be the best cure for migraines at the time. During this period of time, cannabis was still legal and widely accepted in the United States, and was commonly prescribed for nausea, labor pains, and rheumatism. In 1889, an article was published in The Lancet, a leading medical journal, outlined the use of cannabis extracts for the treatment of opium addiction. Cannabis was effective in, release, in reducing opium cravings and acted as an anti-emetic, a drug that reduces nausea and vomiting. 
As the popularity of medical cannabis use increased, so did recreational use. In 1911, Massachusetts became the first state to ban marijuana, with many other states following their lead from 1914 until 1937, when Franklin Roosevelt banned cannabis use, production, and sales. Medicines derived from cannabis were re removed from the U.S. formulary, and physicians were banned from prescribing it in 1943. It was not until 1990 that scientists discovered the existence of the cannabinoid receptor system in the human brain. Cannabinoids are the active chemical compounds in the cannabis plant, THC and CBD being the best researched. Miles Herkenham, senior investigator at the National Institute of Mental Health, proved that the brain contains cannabinoid receptors that bind with the THC and other chemical compounds in marijuana. This discovery provided researchers with a basis for understanding the pharmacological effects of cannabis. There are two types of receptors in our bodies that allow us to feel the effects of med medical cannabis. CB1 receptors, which are found in the brain and spinal cord, and CB2 receptors that are found in the immune tissues. When cannabis is taken into the body, the receptors produce a euphoric state that helps dull symptoms of pain and discomfort. Medical cannabis can be ingested in a number of ways, including smoking, vaporizing, eating edibles, applying it topically to the skin, or in the form of a tincture taken under the tongue. Currently, 23 states and the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana for medical use. So far, 13 states have legalized cannabidiol, more commonly known as CBD, a compound found in cannabis that has been shown to have significant medical benefits. Unlike THC, CBD has no psychoactive effects on patients. The fact that CBD doesn't get you stoned makes it an excellent option for patients seeking relief from pain, inflammation, anxiety, muscle spasms, or psychosis, but do not wish to feel intoxicated. About 45 million Americans suffer from arthritis, which causes severe joint and muscle pain. When smoked or eaten, the cannabinoids in marijuana act as an analgesic and an anti-inflammatory, providing relief from intense pain. One of the most common uses of medical cannabis is to ease the symptoms of nausea and vomiting often experienced by cancer patients going, undergoing chemotherapy. According to the National Cancer Institute, the FDA has approved two cannabis-based drugs dronabinol and nabilone, which were reported to work as well as or better than other drugs to improve nausea and vomiting. Cannabis also helps to stimulate appetite, which is often significantly diminished for weeks after a single chemotherapy treatment. Multiple scler sclerosis is a disabling and unpredictable disease which attacks the central nervous system, causing severe shaking, muscle spasticity, loss of vision, and inability to communicate. In studies performed by the Nas National Multiple Sclerosis Industry, an intake of THC produced a decrease in muscle tremors and stiffness. In 2004, the American Cancer Society also reported that patients who used cannabis in the form of a liquid extract containing both THC and cannabidiol experienced a significant decrease in muscle spasms and shaking. As many as one in five Americans experiences some form of chronic pain. Standard pain medications, such as opioids and anti-inflammatory drugs, are often ineffective in relieving chronic pain and produce adverse side effects, including stroke, heart attack, and even accidental overdose. Several FDA-designed clinical trials have proven that cannabis when inhaled, ingested, or applied topically in extract form, is effective in alleviating nerve-related pain. Although the use of medical marijuana is currently mainly recommended for treating physical illness, there is some evidence that cannabis can relieve symptoms of certain mental disorders. Some patients with bipolar disorder report cannabis use effective in treating both depression and mania, 
and can be a better option for those that experience nausea and fatigue when taking lithium, a, con a commonly prescribed mood stabilizer. Smoking cannabis has been shown to re reduce the severity of flashbacks, panic attacks, and night terrors associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD patients also re report that cannabis helps relieve their insomnia. There's been some mixed evidence on whether cannabis can help with uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, people report um, mixed, mixed results depending on the severity of the depression, um, how much cannabis they're smoking, and just the person themselves. Um, there is a correlation with depression and, and um, high rates of cannabis use, but um, it is believed that it is mainly um, caused by uh, similar, similar environments that um, produce depression can be conducive to high cannabis use, so it's not necessarily that uh, high rates of cannabis use cause depression, it's just that they are um, correlated because of similar environments. And, um, so the future potential of cannabis as medicine. Uh, recently, the federal government conducted a study on effectiveness of cannabis on reducing the size of aggressive types of brain tumors when combined with radiation treatment. Researchers at St. George's University of London found that deadly brain cancer masses in mice shrank after being exposed to both THC and CBD. Both cannabinoids also made the tumors more receptive to radiation treatment. Although the FDA does not yet consider the marijuana plant to be medicinal, scientific study of cannabinoids has led to two FDA-approved medications that contain the compounds in pill form. Continued research may lead to more cannabis-derived medications being developed. Another team of scientists in the United Kingdom has found that cannabinoids have the ability to kill cancerous cells in people with leukemia. Cannabinoids may be more effective than currently used drugs because they target multiple processes that cancers need to survive. The six non-psychoactive cannabinoids examined in the study were shown to have the ability to target and switch off pathways that allow cancer to grow. Cannabis is already known to be effective in treating chronic pain and weight loss associated with HIV, but a growing body of research suggests that the plant may be able to stop the spread of the disease itself. Last year, a Louisiana State University study showed that a daily dose of THC decreased damage to immune tissues in infected primate stomachs, one of the most common areas in the body for the HIV infection to spread. While HIV spreads by infecting and killing off immune cells, primates that receive the daily THC treatments maintain higher levels of healthy cells. Although there is plenty of evidence that marijuana use can be beneficial for people suffering from these life-threatening illnesses, it is extremely difficult to con conduct federally approved studies because cannabis is still listed by the federal government as a Schedule I drug, which means a highly addictive substance with no known medical use. Scientists have, have to jump through hoops to obtain secure and legal samples from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which sets research back for months and sometimes even years. Right now, the government, in association with the National Institute of Drug Abuse, grows a limited supply of marijuana, but spends most of their time in funding conducting studies on the negative effects of marijuana use. Thankfully, the wave of me medical marijuana legalization in multiple states has brought discussion of the plant's healing potential to the forefront of American public policy debates. Earlier this, earlier this year, the American Academy of Pediatrics suggested that the government downgrade marijuana to a Schedule II drug to allow for future research on its potential to treat children who suffer from seizures. Over the past few years, there have been multiple reports of children that suffer from dramatic seizures, sometimes lasting for hours, finally finding relief from taking CBD in liquid form after trying countless pharmaceuticals that seem to produce more negative side effects than benefits. Unfortunately, even in states where me medical marijuana is legal, 
Parents may still live in fear of providing their children with a completely natural substance that gives them the ability to live a normal life. Suppliers of medical marijuana are not immune to criminal crackdowns because it is still considered an illegal substance by the federal government. Last month, a bill called the Compassionate Access Research Expansion, Expansion and Respect States Act, or CARES Act, was introduced to the U.S. Senate, proposing to change federal law so that states could regulate medical cannabis without fear of prosecution. If the bill is passed, it would allow medical marijuana to be prescribed to veterans receiving care in federal veterans administration facilities. It would be rescheduled from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 2, allowing government funding to be spent on research. CBD would be removed from the Controlled Substance Substances Act's federal definition of marijuana, and it would remove federal restrictions for banking with medical dispensaries. It is imperative that we remove cannabis as a Schedule One drug so we can move forward as a nation and potentially cure these debilitating and life-threatening illnesses. When it comes to changing political policy, knowledge is the most powerful tool we have. Now that we have so much evidence of the amazing healing properties of cannabis, we can spread this information to help defeat the stigma against this natural healer. Passing the CARES Act would be a small step towards legalization, but extremely significant for, for providing patients with the medical care they desperately need. If you support lifting federal restrictions on medical cannabis and allowing research to continue, you can write to your senators and tell them why passing this bill is necessary. Um, I'd also like to speak a little bit on Senate Bill 5052, which was just passed really recently. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons to this bill. Um, I think the goal of this bill is to kind of reconcile the medical system with um, the recreational system in Washington. Um, the pros are that it would, re it would maintain a tax exempt status for all cannabis purchases made by qualifying patients. Um, possession, uh, possession limits can be increased with physician recommendation and it provides legal protection for patients and providers, but plenty of medical patients um, disagree with the passage of this bill um, because it would greatly reduce the amount of cannabis that patients are allowed to possess from 24 ounces to 3. It would reduce the amount of plants they can cultivate from 15 to 6 and require patients to join a database to receive legal protection. Um, so if you're interested in um, protecting patients' rights, it could be a good idea to write to Governor Jay Inslee and tell him why you believe that this bill should not be passed, because although it has already um, been passed uh, in Washington, it's still awaiting approval from the governor. So that is how to take action if you believe in protecting those rights for medical patients and if there's time I'd like to open it up to discussion for questions and comments. Ten minutes for questions. Ten minutes? Okay. Suppose we could just have people come up here to do questions. Um, I'll ask a question. Um, my uh, interest as of late uh, with cannabis is it as a uh, sacramental medicine, using it in the context of uh, ceremony and ritual and, uh, and the richness uh, around uh, having a community and experience to uh, facilitate uh, greater psychological healing and I'm wondering in all your research what uh, what examples and traditions you've come upon throughout various cultures in the past or in the present uh, that uh, have some uh, ceremonial usage and uh, yeah whatever you know about that. Um, so my research is mostly focused on medicinal health benefits of cannabis and so I didn't exactly get into a whole lot about you know religious use besides the speculated use in the Bible, which has not been confirmed. So there's a little bit of speculation that um, 
cannabis oil was used to, you know, set apart the sacred from the secular, but um, there's also a lot of opinions that it was a different plant that was used, or a multitude of different plants, so there's no re real way yet to, to prove that it was cannabis. But, um, yeah, I'd like to open it up if anybody else has any information about that they would like to speak. I, I know that Blue Morpho, they... Yeah, speaking to the microphone, but we're, we're getting to see... Can we take the mic down? Are you yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the only thing I know about as far as using uh, marijuana as a sacred plant is uh, Blue Morpho is a uh, ayahuasca um, uh, center down in... Uh, Ketos Peru, and I know for like the past year they've been doing uh, online, you know, like um, uh, you know, virtual. They're, they're doing uh, uh, using cannabis as a sacrament, but they're you can actually go to the Blue Morpho site. I've never actually done it, but I know that they're do they do like a weekly uh, thing that you can that you can view. So we'll check that out, Blue Morpho. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I was wondering if you uh, could uh, provide a good reference as far as how to stay aware and knowledgeable about um, medicinal marijuana use and rules and restrictions in different states. Yeah, um, leafly.com is an excellent resource for that. It um, started out as an online database for different medicinal marijuana strains, and it provides a lot of um, really good information about that, not only that, but um, it also posts news updates for basically everything that happens in the politics about marijuana. So that, and yeah, that was my main resource for that. So yeah, weekly.com is excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Also, as a quick follow-up question, I didn't know if you came across any accounts of people who were um, like registered medicinal marijuana users and that impact on their health insurance. I've heard stories mm -hmm. outside of um, outside of marijuana use where people have like, even Google searched symptoms that they've had or something like that. It's kind of tracked associated with their records and then mm -hmm. insurance companies will say, oh, well, you know, I saw that you had this issue, you know, yeah. this time ago and you said you had no recurring issues, things like that. Have there been any uh, issues of conflict with insurance? And um, not in the state of Washington that I'm aware of. I'm, I don't know about other medicinal, medical marijuana states, but I haven't come across any evidence of that. Well, thank yeah, you. thank you. What was the name of that website again? Leafly.com, L-E-A-F-L-Y. Thank you.